Welcome back everyone. In today's lesson, we're going to continue where we stopped in the previous lesson. In this video, I'm going to show you how to promote your server, which is a domain controller, after you've installed the Active Directory domain services role, or also known as ADDS for short. Once we finish promoting the server, I will also show you how you can go and do some of your first basic tasks on Active Directory, which includes things like creating user accounts, creating groups, and when we're done of that, I will also give you a quick demo on how and where you could possibly use the Active Directory groups that you created. Uh, this is just to help you better understand their purpose, in other words. Now that we have the agenda out of the way, please note that if you don't know how to install the Active Directory Domain Services role, or ADDS for short, we did cover that in a previous lesson, so you might want to go and watch that first before watching this video. If you know how to do that, well, stay tuned. Okay, so I think it's time we jump to it and show you guys how to promote that server after we've installed that role. So let's quickly circle back to my virtual machine. And here we are, folks, back onto the virtual machine. Now, in the previous episode, you would remember we last installed the ADDS role and we left it at that. So we're going to continue where we left off in the previous episode, which was installing the ADDS role. You can see here. It shows us ADDS has been installed, but in no way has it been configured yet. So what we're going to go and do is we can go click here on the notification section and then we're just going to go click here on promote the server to a domain controller. Now there's actually more than one way you can go and do this. Normally right after installing the ADDS role, there's actually another link that you can go click in that little wizard that will also do the same thing. For now, I'm just going to go click on this one here. And here we go on our first list of options. Now, bear in mind, the server we are doing this on is our very first domain controller. If this is your very, very first domain controller, you will have to choose this option at the bottom that says add a new forest because we currently have no forest. Now, if you already have an existing domain um, and you just want to go and add this server because you plan on dropping this at a branch office, maybe you are planning on using an RODC setup, read only domain controller setup, you could potentially go and use this option at the top that says add a domain controller to an existing domain. This option is also pretty handy if you plan on having fault tolerance in your domain. In other words, you plan on having two or more domain controllers which are clones of one another in the same location. So in the event of one of them failing for whatever reason, the other one will serve as a backup. So the very, very first one you create will still have to be this option here, add a new forest. But once you go and make the second one and maybe even a third one or so, that second and third one, you are essentially just going to go and add to an existing domain. That's what you're going to do there. So we, we're not going to add this to an existing domain because we have none at this point in time. This second option is something you're probably going to find yourself almost never using. Uh, this is maybe a situation where you have a huge company, maybe an international company, that's got branch offices in various countries, maybe in Japan, United States, United Kingdom, somewhere in Africa. And um, each of these countries basically has their own domain, perhaps, and all that. So that's when you want to go and use that option. We're almost never going to use that option. So most of the time, you're either going to use this option at the bottom or that option at the top. And if I'm being perfectly honest with you guys, you're probably going to be in an existing environment. So if you're working for a company, you're probably going to find yourself in an existing environment. And if that's the case, you're almost never ever going to go and choose this option at the bottom because in an existing environment, you're probably just going to go and add servers to an existing environment. This one at the bottom is if you are starting the company's very first server, which is very unlikely. The only time you're going to do that if this is if this is a new company or if you're doing this for testing purposes, you know, just to go and test something or ironically, if you're doing a course like what we're doing right now. So for now, I'm just going to leave it on that option. Root domain. So what do I want my domain here to be? I'm going to go and spitball and call it burningicetech.com. There we go. That should be sufficient for now. Click next. All right. On this page, you get to join, choose your forest functional level in your domain functional level. Now, for the most part, there's no real difference here. You know, if you want to go and choose that. So for now, I'm just going to leave it on the highest one. It is worth noting that you should keep an eye on what your company currently has in their environment. So if they currently have existing servers in the environment and these servers are perhaps running very old versions of server, perhaps 2008, 2012, then it might be suggested that you go to a lower version of server. But for, for the most part, there's no real difference here. The idea is it's supposed to give you additional features and goodies for the most part. 
But honestly speaking, there's no real difference here. The only time I've really seen a big difference here is when we were on server 2008, they basically added an ability for you to go and recover something like user accounts if you went and deleted them. So they added a little recycle bin. So if you go to Active Directory and you go and delete someone's user account, you had the ability or you got the ability then to go and recover that from the recycle bin. I thought that was pretty cool. But other than that, there's no real difference here. So if it's your very first server, I would suggest go with the latest one, obviously. So this is my first one. If it's your first server, you currently obviously have no DNS server in your environment. DNS is something we are still going to expand in a different episode. We don't want to go and sidetrack now, otherwise we're going to confuse people. So if it's your first DNS or your first domain controller, you are going to need a DNS. So you can see it's automatically ticked that for you, which is very convenient, I must say. If it's not your first server, if it's your second, your third or so, you're going to find in most cases it's going to detect that you already have a DNS server in your environment. And you're not going to actually be able to install that because it's going to see that it already is one. So for now, it's automatically detecting there is none. So I'm going to leave it on that for now. So it's actually going to go and add two roles or two things for me now. Password. So this is your main administrator account password, the one that you're going to be using in the beginning. It's probably one of the only accounts you're going to have in the beginning. It's also the account that you will use in the event of you needing to recover this environment. So if you found yourself in a pickle one day where you need to go and recover from a backup of some sort, this is the password you're going to be prompted for. So for now, I'm going to go and choose an eight character password, meeting the minimum password complexity requirements. Whoops, here we go. Eight character password, uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and symbols. I'm going to go click next. Now, if anyone sees this message, you are pretty much guaranteed to find that message, especially if this is your very first domain controller. It simply just means it's not finding any DNS server. And we know that because this is our very first server. We literally just saw a moment ago that the DNS box was ticked because it's going to go and install that for us. So at this point in time, you are pretty much guaranteed to see that message. I wouldn't worry about it. It's it's not something important. It simply just means it's not detecting any DNS and we're going to go and install that now automatically. So nothing to worry about. Next. All right. And on this menu, it simply is going to go and take my, my domain name, which I specified earlier, being burningicetech.com. And it's just going to shorten it to something sweeter. So whatever you typed in there, the domain section, your root domain, it simply is going to go and take that and shorten it. So if mine was burningicetech.local, it would take .local away, in my case .com away, and it's going to make it something short and sweet. So that's basically what's going to happen here. Just going to go click on next. On this menu, guys, you can just leave it on the defaults. Honestly speaking, I don't really know anyone that actually ever goes and changes this. So I would suggest just leave it on the defaults. So essentially, your Active Directory is a database. Um, even in the beginning, when there's nothing on it, like in my case, it's still a database. And this is where that's going to be stored, especially that first one there. So it's showing you it's going to be on C, Windows, NTDS. By default, that thing is already about 20 megabytes in size. There's your log files. There's your sys volume files of some basic settings. For the most part, I would say just leave it. So I'm just going to go click on Next giving you a view screen, a summary, if you will, of what are some of the options are that you've chosen. And you can see on the next screen, it's going to go basically going to go ahead and do a prerequisite check, just checking if we meet all the requirements. And we know we do, because in the previous lesson, we specifically covered the prerequisites of ADDS and a domain controller, some of which is giving your server a name, making sure it's got an IP address, making sure it's a static IP address, making sure it's got a subnet and a DNS and all that kinds of jazz. So we know for a fact we are going to meet the prerequisites because we made sure of that in the previous lesson. So I'm going to go ahead here and click on next. As you guys can see, all prerequisite checks passed successfully. That's what we assumed. Um, honestly, I mean, if it gave me an error, I would really be surprised. It'd probably just be a matter of I've got something. And luckily, I did not. And all it's left to do here, guys, is just to go click on install. So once it's done installing this, uh, then you're pretty much set up. That's really actually all there is to it. There's not much to it. You know, everybody that's got a domain controller, whether it be the first one, their second one, their third one, all domain controllers had to go through this procedure. So this is something everybody has to go through. Now, once we are done with this, you're going to see it's going to want to restart this server. So at the moment, I'm currently just on a work group situation, which is what you would have seen in the previous lesson. This server is not on any domain. It's not joined to a domain. It's going to be my domain controller. So currently, it's on a work group. As soon as it's done installing this, it's going to want to restart. And once it restarts, 
you're going to see it's going to prompt me to log on to my domain for the first time, which is probably going to be with my main admin account. So for now, I'm going to fast forward for you guys just to speed things along. A few moments later. And we're back. As you can see, the server has just restarted. And now here at the bottom, it says sign into Burning Ice Tech, which is the name of our domain we just created. So whatever you go and choose the name of your domain, that's what's going to reflect here. So now it's just a matter of choosing a user account on your Active Directory because we're no longer authenticating locally. We're going to be authenticating to the Active Directory, which coincidentally is the server. Now we have no accounts, as you guys know, so I'm just going to go and use the main administrator account for now. That should suffice. Let's log on. And there we go. Back on the server manager dashboard. Now, Earlier we did briefly see a DDS installed here when we started this, but we had a notification at the top that said we needed to go and promote. That has now been taken care of. So now we have a domain and we have DNS. DNS is obviously not really configured yet at this time, but that's obviously something for a different video. These are essentially server lists. So if I were to go click here on ADDS, it's going to show me all my servers that I've got for ADDS. Same can be said for DNS here. So this is a good idea or a good place to get an idea as to which roles you currently have on the server. So if I click on dashboard, it's also going to give you an indication of what's been installed here. Now, if I want to go and manage my Active Directory or configure some of the basic tasks, more than one way you can go and do that. So I'm going to go click here on tools, top right hand side. And the one we're going to be focusing on today is Active Directory users and computers. Now, to a certain extent, you can actually also go and do a lot of these tasks by using Active Directory Administrative Center for those of you that feel like doing that. For now, I'm going to go and use Active Directory Users and Computers, which is what everybody's been using for many, many moons. So let's go ahead and click on that. And there we go. We are now in Active Directory Users and Computers. So what's going to happen here is, is it will display to you all your domains, assuming you have more than one. Most companies I've dealt with only has one. So as you can see, I've only got one here. That's pretty much as default as things get. Now, if I were to go and expand this, it's going to show you all the default containers. You would remember if you follow the series, if you watch the previous episodes, these are all containers. They look like folders, but we refer to them as containers. These are built-in containers that was made automatically by the server. If I were to go and make some more now myself, those are for the most part going to be OUs, organizational units, also something we covered in a previous video. So everything that we see here, whether it's a container or not, is an object. So the built-in containers, the custom containers I made myself afterwards, the user accounts, the groups, the computers, everything you see here is an object, people. So I think I'm going to start things off here by creating a user account first. So there's multiple ways you can go about that. We first need to establish where do we want to go and create that user account. Now, normally this would involve you creating your own little custom containers here first, known as organizational units. And in those organizational units, you would go and create your users, your groups, your computers, and so on and so forth. For now, I'm just going to keep it as simple as possible. I'm going to click here on users. Just drag that a little bit to the right. It shows me the built-in groups we've got and the built-in user accounts. Now, there's not much. You can see user accounts. You can identify them by this little person. It just shows you one little person there. And groups, you can see there's got like two little people there for the most part. Almost all of these are built-in groups for the most part. Now, how you go ahead and create a user, and I did briefly touch on this in the previous video, you can either right-click on that container, hover your mouse cursor over where it says new, and you can just go click on user if that's what you want to go and create. And that's what we are going to go and create now. Or alternatively, you can go and click there on group or you can go click on computer. It's normally going to be group or user in most cases. Another way you can go and do it is, is once you are in the container, which is where we are right now, you right click on a blank space and then it's the same story. You hover over new and you can, can either go to group or user. Lastly, you can also go to the top here at the right top here where it says create a new user. You can see there's options here, create new group, create new user in this container. So for now, let's just go right click there, new user. All right, so when you just go and specify this individual's name, so 
this is probably going to be someone new you just hired at this company maybe they started today this morning so i'm going to go make up a name i'm going to thumb suck it john smith there we go here you get to go and choose what this person will log on as so when john gets to his station every day in the morning on his laptop or his desktop what does he or she need to type in to be able to log on to their machine every day in the morning so you could go and use the person's name if you want to but you need to keep in mind this is probably going to be a rather decent sized organization so the chances are there there might very well be someone else with that name being john so there's going to be a conflict obviously so what i would advise you to go and use is and this is only suggestive is maybe j smith so the first initial of he, his name or her name, and then followed by the last name. So obviously there's still a chance there could be someone like that, but it's less likely. You could go use the person's full name with the first initial of the last name, or maybe use an employee number or whatever the case might be. Up to you, honestly. You can also go and choose the company's domains if they have more than one. I only have the one for now, so I'm going to leave it on that. Next, choose the individual's password. Uh, usually but not always this is probably going to be a temporary password so usually in most organizations when you go and create this person's account you're going to go and choose a password for him or her and this is probably going to be a temporary password which this individual will use only once upon first logon it normally prompts the average person to go and change their password now this is not set in stone as you can see by looking at some of these options here so the default is user must change password that next logon, which is normally the norm for most companies. So you allow this person to go and choose their own password, which even I as the administrator will not know. Now, if you're concerned about, okay, so if I don't know the password, how do I help this individual that we get locked out? You as the administrator don't need to know someone's password to be able to reset their password. At any point in time, if you've got the right privilege, which we do right now, you can come in here to Active Directory, right click on that individual's account, and you'll see there's an option that says Reset Password. We'll show you that in a moment. So let's just choose a password for now. There we go, I've typed the password twice. Um, there's other options here you can go and choose. For example, user cannot change password. We don't use that often. Um, that might be used for an administrator account or maybe an account that's used by something other than a human like a printer, a scanner or a synchronization account of some sorts. Third option says password never expires. Also up to you when and why you want to use that. I can't tell you why you want to use that but from experience I can tell you this is normally used by um, admin accounts. Maybe once again an account that's not used by a human because a computer or a printer or a scanner or whatever cannot go and change its password once it expires. The last one is something we're going to go and use only for templates. So if you're going to go use a template, you can go and use that. Or if this is an individual that is not going to start today, you can go and use that. Or if this is an individual that has left the organization for whatever reason, you can go and use that afterwards. So more on that later. That is actually going to be a topic later on in this course. I'm going to leave it on the defaults for now. Next, confirmation, finish. And there we go, folks. You can see John Smith has just been created. Now back onto the topic of resetting this individual's password. So obviously once John logs on for the first time, it's going to prompt Mr. John to go and change his password to something more permanent. Uh, well, not completely permanent. I mean, it depends on what your password expiration policies are at that point in time at that company. Um, so it's going to probably last him about 42 days to 90 de days, depending on what your password expiration policies is. So you just go right click on this individual. And you can see here's the ability to go and reset a person's password without knowing the original. So as the admin, you just right click on the user in question. So when John logs a ticket and says, I forgot my password, boo-hoo, click on reset, just choose a new password without knowing the original password. That's how we do it. Now, when it comes to creating groups, pretty much the same procedure. So I'm just going to go ahead and right click there again, new group and i'm just going to go and choose something simple for now let's just make it it okay and as you can see we've just created ourselves a new group the icons look different as you can see there now what you can go and do is and this is definitely something you're going to probably be using in companies is you can go and add your users into those groups and you can probably do this by 10 or 20 different ways you can right click on the user and say add to group 
you can go to the group itself right click on the group and say add to group and you can just go type the person's name or you can go right click on the group go to properties go to members and add the user's name I mean that's just free out of so many ways I know of how you can go and do this so I'm gonna go ahead and quickly go and add this user to that group check name as you can see it detects the group okay and the user has just been added to that specific group so now this is going to help you going forward and um, it's worth noting that a user can be in more than one group a group can actually even be inside of a group so i can't tell you why i'd want to use that but so it's only limited by your imagination in the, the day so there might be a situation where John is maybe an IT individual because I've just added John. So he works in the IT department, obviously. But for all we know, John is maybe the manager in the IT department or one of them at least. So we might find that John also needs to be in a manager group of some kind, just a general manager group. So this is going to make your work a lot easier. So if I need to go and give the IT staff permission to go and access a certain resource at some point in time, Instead of having to go and add each and every one of these users we've got here, that's going to be a painstaking process. So I can just go and add the IT group, automatically giving all the IT users permission. Same can be said about the managers group and the other group. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to start off with our little demo, which I said I'm going to go and do. So let's go to the desktop of the server. Let's create ourselves a folder here. Call it whatever, test resources that should suffice for now so obviously in companies there's certain resources some people need to have access to and some people should not have access to you can do this by many ways you can go use ntfs permissions sharing permissions and also group policies and things like that i'm going to go ahead and right click on this folder in question properties so we only want certain people to have access to this resource so if it's something you're going to be sharing over the network so this, this folder is obviously on my server. As you guys can see at the top, I'm on a server. This folder is going to be shared from the server over the network to my users. So you might want to first of all go and share it, you know, if it's not shared. So I'm going to go here and say share. You can go and choose a user or a group of people. Alternatively, you can go here to advanced sharing, give it a name, test resources. That's fine for now. Apply. Okay. It's been shared. Then we go here to security. You can see at the moment only the administrators has access to this folder. So what if John needs to access this over the network? So if John logs on to his machine, his station, and he go browses to the server, you know, by typing in the server's name. So he's going to go here, type in whack whack or backslash backslash, and he's going to go and type in the server's actual name here being um, that one there at the top, most likely. No, I'm lying. It's not that one. It's a um, burning ice tick because we labeled or renamed the server in the previous lesson. So if he goes to the server's name, it's going to allow him to see that, ser that folder. But will John be able to access that folder? Probably not. So we're going to have to go here to edit. That's one way out of so many ways. And we're going to go and add the user or users or groups of users. So I can go here to add. And I can now essentially go and add a user or a group of users. So imagine you've got 20, 50, or 100 people that needs to have access to that folder. Are you honestly going to go and add each and every one of those people one by one? You could, I suppose, but we highly recommend against that because that's very tedious. It's going to take you forever and a day to do that. So instead, why not just add the relevant groups which those people are in? So if you guys remember, John is in the IT department. So we're just going to go and add the whole IT department. Let's see if we can find that. Check it out. It finds that group. So now John and anyone else which happens to be in that group is automatically going to be granted access here. I'm going to click on OK. So there we go. The IT department, doesn't matter who is in that group, everybody in that group will have access to this folder. Now what kind of access they have and what they can go and do that I'll determine here with these little tick boxes, which is not a topic for today, but I can, for example, now just go and give them full access. So now John and anyone else in that group automatically has full access to that folder should they want to go and access that over the network. So I'm going to go click on OK and apply. Apply. OK. Close. 
So now it's simply a matter of John just accessing that over the network as easy as that, guys. Well, it's that time of the video, boys and girls. So like usual, please give this video a like. It really does help me quite a lot more than you know. Um, I hope this video has been informative like usual. And if you are new to this channel and to this series, please smash the subscribe button. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to follow the series. And I'll see you guys next time on the next lesson. Bye, guys. Let me...